All right, good morning. Um, welcome back. Uh, it's nice to see that everything actually looks like Western now. There's people all over the place um, walking around. Uh, I assume you're like me. The geese are making me uncomfortable again, uh, which is nice. Uh, and that's like a big two week difference. Like two weeks ago, they were just kind of wandering around silently and now they're sort of you know, up uh, and intimidating everyone. So uh, it's good to be back. They don't seem to have any interest in, <laughs> they don't care. That's what I kind of like about the geese. Like when it's not this time of year, they have absolutely no interest in humans. Like they just completely ignore you. And then this time of year for about a month, they just uh, threaten everyone that walks near them. So it's, they, they have no interest in what we do. They don't regard us in any way at all, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the uh, uh, lecture here. Um, and maybe I'll go ahead and uh, let's see, I have to fall, hide floating meeting controls. I'm gonna move myself up here in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and there we are. So let's get started by discussing the final exam. Actually, let me just back up a bit. Grades will be available for the midterm in, in a very short amount of time, like probably today, tomorrow at the absolute latest. Just need to make sure everything works out the way we expected. Uh, there was a lot of writing. And of course, there's 150 of us in this class, which you wouldn't know necessarily because we're not all here, but there's actually a larger number of uh, students enrolled in the class uh, than I've had in the past. So it takes a little bit longer to get through all the written work. Uh, but I do expect to have uh, all of the things posted, uh, your marks posted uh, sometime uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, so uh, just hold fast uh, and they should be all there. Um, our final exam, of course, is, as you know, an in-person uh, conventional written uh, three hour long exam. The question uh, formats will be similar to what you had to what we had in the midterm. Uh, so same kinds of questions, the same balance of multiple choice, uh, written uh, short answer and that sort of thing. Um, so it won't be a different uh, content. Uh, you know, it won't be a different way to access the content. It'll be new content, obviously. It's everything from today until the end of the term. Um, but you'll be writing it instead of uh, doing it online. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be that much different. So as you can see, this is the tentative uh, final exam schedule. Uh, and we are scheduled to do the exam on Sunday, April 10th uh, at 10 a.m. in the Social Science Center. We'll be spread across three different rooms right next to each other. Uh, so at some point, you'll find out which one of those three rooms you need to be in. It'll probably be uh, by alphabetical, by last name or something. Uh, this is tentative, but this should be finalized within uh, two weeks, I think. Um, this is the second tentative schedule. I don't think ours is gonna change. Uh, so most likely this will be when it is. So if you happen to have uh, accommodated uh, services, so if you have a, an extended period, uh, time extension for your exam, you'll do that the way you used to, uh, which is uh, making arrangements with accommodated exam services, uh, and you'll take the exam there at the same time. Uh, and of course, any of the other sort of uh, things that come up. If there's a conflict, I think there's a conflict exam policy. I forget exactly what the details are, but I think it's like three exams in a day or something like that. Uh, but don't, I, I, if that's not official, I'm not 100% sure. You you can check the official, uh, the registrar or exam services for that. Yes. Do you know when the final list will be posted? I think it's supposed to be by the end of, um, I think it's supposed to be in two weeks. So sometime before March week of March 17th or something, 18th or something like that. I'm not 100% sure. So I just, I probably know about as much as you all do. So, uh, but I don't think this is gonna change. So I would put this on your calendar now. Uh, and then if and when it does changes, uh, we'll all find out at roughly the same time. I don't have any insight. And I also, as I'm sure you know, I don't have any control over uh, when the exams are scheduled for this class, where they're scheduled, how they're scheduled. Uh, that's something that's done centrally. Uh, so probably gonna be April 10th, yes. Uh, you were mentioning something about earlier how it might be open book. And yes. How, do you know anything more? About oh, yeah, it'll still be an open book exam. Uh, how we're going to do that, I guess, uh, you'll be able to print notes. So I, I'm working on the details for that. Um, so I'd like you to be able to bring your book with you if you have one. Uh, and I'll probably make it possible for you to either uh, have electronic devices uh, in the exam, so your laptop, uh, so that you can look things up. Um, or uh, to be able to print up something so that there's no electronic uh, 
uh, devices allowed in the exam. So I'm sorry, I don't have more information yet. Uh, I've been trying to figure out the best and most effective way uh, to still allow for the open book uh, access to things. Um, there's enough room in those classrooms, by the way, uh, that there'll be about, uh, I think, 40, 50 people in each exam uh, room, and they hold 200, lots of space. So you won't be sitting next to someone. Uh, so you will be able to uh, access uh, written work. Uh, it seems to me probably the best way to do it is to allow for, uh, rather than electronic devices, uh, to allow you to bring in printed uh, material. But we'll work through some of that, and I might even reach out to everybody and ask for your uh, input on that. Uh, so this is the kind of thing where I just haven't worked out all the details yet. Does that seem okay? So I'll, I'll probably have that uh, worked out in the next uh, a week or so. I wasn't sure how we were going to do the final exam, so I wasn't sure if it was going to be in person uh, or online. But since you've been doing everything so far for the last year and a half, actually almost two years online, this will probably be your first written exam in quite a while, won't it? When was the last time you all had a written final exam in a big classroom? First year. So yeah, not since first year. That's what I was going to think. Is some most of you are third and fourth year students, right? Uh, so it wouldn't have been through. Wow, and even like the first years. If you were first year, that's when we did actually get kicked out of campus early, right? You all had to leave res like, like they're like everybody go, and everybody like had to leave really quickly. So you haven't had a final exam since the fall term of 2019. Wow, that's pretty crazy. So yeah, I'd like to make sure that you have access to your notes and uh, we'll try to do it in a way that uh, works out well for everybody. I, it, you know what I mean? It's sort of hard to track time. I feel like this has been somewhere between 20 years and six months. Uh, it's Sometimes it's like a short amount of time. Sometimes it's a fast amount of time. So more information on the final exam will be coming, but I expect to be able to provide to figure out some way to make it effective and efficient for you to have access to information uh, like open book and open note. Okay, so let's talk about uh, inductive reasoning. So today's course, first half, second half, we'll be doing it exactly like we did before. Uh, we'll have one half of the uh, course uh, for about an hour or so, take a 15 minute break, then come back again. We're gonna talk about inductive reasoning. Everything from here on end to the end of the class is gonna be on the final exam. Induction, deduction, problem solving, uh, context, uh, cognitive biases, expertise, all of these more complex cognition uh, uh, topics. Uh, so today I wanna to talk a little bit about the difference between reasoning styles, inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning. We're gonna talk about deduction next week. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about hypothesis testing and how it's a way to, uh, a, a way to test hypotheses based on what you think, uh, based on the information that you have. And that's one form of inductive reasoning. Uh, and then we'll take a break somewhere around here uh, where we talk about the problem of induction. This is a philosophical problem. Uh, so the problem of induction is whether or not induction is logically possible. Uh, some would suggest maybe it can't be done, uh, can't be described logically, but of course we do uh, behave uh, inductively. So that's something we'll probably talk about either right at the very end of this section or at the beginning of the next section. Uh, and then we'll talk about ways in which we can express uh, induction as a categorical or a categorical reasoning uh, behavior. Uh, and also the way in which the structure of categories like their internal coherence guides your inductions and your predictions. So let's define induction as the process of using what you know to predict uh, what you will probably observe uh, given some set of features or stimuli. So it's a probabilistic process. Uh, you take what you know about things and you make an inference or you make a prediction. Uh, most of the time you expect those inferences uh, to be justified or to be uh, confirmed, but not always, right? So induction means that you're looking to uh, see what comes next. You're looking to reduce uncertainty. An example I gave uh, either the last class or two classes ago, uh, I suggested that we use our memories uh, to decide what to do in new situations. And I mentioned that we haven't, you haven't been in a large lecture class for a while. Uh, so at the beginning of this course, the beginning of this term, when we first started uh, doing in-person classes, 
Uh, everybody walks in and you kind of already know what to do, right? You base that on your memory. Uh, you sort of had an idea of what to expect. Uh, even though you haven't had a class in person in a while, uh, you sort of had some ideas uh, of how that was going to work. Uh, that's an example of an inductive inference. You've got a body of knowledge. You've got things that you know. You've got concepts uh, and schemas and organized memory structures. And you use those to try to predict what comes next so that you're not always surprised uh, when something happens. Uh, the best thing you can do is to try to reduce uh, uncertainty, to know what happens next and to know how things work. That's exactly the point uh, that Sue Savage Rumbaugh made about the, the bonobo chimps. Remember, she was talking about uh, bonobos uh, learning to use language and trying to use that as a way to figure out what's gonna happen next. Uh, so the communication that we do uh, with others is often a way to figure out how to reduce the uncertainty when we're behaving with people. So a lot of what we've been talking about already falls under this umbrella of induction, using what we know to predict what we're probably going to observe or experience giving some set uh, of stimuli uh, or features. I've also used the example of winter squashes a lot. Uh, so we suggested that uh, most of us might be familiar with uh, the exterior of a pumpkin, right? We know what a pumpkin looks like on the outside. Uh, and most of us are familiar with the interior of a pumpkin. Uh, or if you're not, you would be familiar with some kind of squash, right? Most of us are familiar with what's on the outside and what's on the inside. And most of us, we agreed, are also not very familiar, although obviously by the end of this course, you will be more familiar with the Hubbard squash. <laughs> uh, but we're not very familiar with the Hubbard squash. However, we can note uh, that there are some similarities on the outside. We also know that they belong to the same category, and that's an important aspect here. So even if it's something that I've never experienced, I've never had a Hubbard squash, somebody says, oh, it's a member of the winter squash category. It's a winter squash, just like a pumpkin or just like a butternut squash. And you might say, well, I don't, I've never seen one on the inside, but given what I know and given what I've observed about other kinds of similar pumpkins or other kinds of similar squash rather, I think I know what's gonna be on the inside. And so that's an example of using an inductive process, using what you know to predict what you haven't yet observed. So it's a way of predicting the future. Uh, it's a way of reducing uncertainty. You expect this kind of interior uh, to be there. So you're predicting what you're going to find next. And that's what induction is all about. It's a way to use your knowledge to predict the future, to reduce the uncertainty, and to know what comes next. So let's talk a little bit about how it differs from deductive reasoning. Uh, then let's go through a series of examples and some of the constraints on induction. Uh, so when we're talking about reasoning in general, we're two broadly defined kinds of reasoning. Uh, one would be deductive logic, uh, which uh, we'll talk about next week, and the inductive method, which we'll talk about this week. In general, deductive thinking is uh, much more strictly defined. Uh, in deductive thinking, we take a hypothesis and it leads to systematic observations. Uh, a premise leads to a specific conclusion. In general, the deductive method is one in which we take uh, a prediction, a series of predictions, a series of premises and statements and facts, and make a very specific conclusion. Uh, that very specific conclusion in the deductive method, uh, if the argument is structured in a sound way, uh, is guaranteed uh, to be um, uh, to be confirmed. So in a logically sound argument, uh, in a logically valid argument, your conclusions are also valid. Uh, so it's a strictly formal way of using observations, uh, premises and statements of facts to arrive at a specific conclusion and then to determine the validity of that conclusion. So it's a general to specific type of reasoning. You take some general uh, premises, general rules, uh, and then you make specific predictions, specific conclusions, which you can then uh, be assured are valid. Inductive thinking often makes specific uh, predictions, uh, but inductive thinking emphasizes observations and how they lead to the hypothesis in the first place. Uh, it's often characterized as a specific to general form of thinking, because with induction, you're observing things. 
uh, you're making observations about uh, what's in the world. You're making observations about things that you're presented with. You're trying to make connections to what you already know. And then you're trying to make generalizations. The other big difference between deduction and induction is that with induction, we're making a probabilistic inference. So we assume that what we're going to predict is going to, is going to be confirmed, but we're not sure. Uh, with deduction, you can structure an argument so that what you predict or what you conclude uh, is guaranteed uh, to be observed. Uh, so that's the other main uh, distinction between the two. I'll spend more time next week talking about the distinction when we talk about deduction. So today, I'll bring up the idea. Next week, we'll come back to this idea of the difference between induction and deduction. But for now, let's think about induction as primarily observations leading to hypotheses which then lead to uh, inferences and predictions. So it's a specific to general form of thinking, but often a specific inference is made. So uh, you decide what you might see when you cut open the Hubbard squash. That's a specific uh, inference that you're making based on observations. And of course, every time you cut open a Hubbard squash, you then have more information about what's gonna be in that Hubbard squash. And you do two or three of them, You've now processed three Hubbard squashes. Each one of them looks the same on the inside and you get more and more convinced that that's what it's gonna be like. So that's your specific to general form of thinking. Um, so inferences are conclusions based on the available evidence. And these can be specific and they can be general uh, depending on uh, the needs that you have. Uh, here's one that uh, has used to come up a lot when uh, in the old days, how many of you, your parents maybe, or at this point, maybe grandparents even, would still have a landline phone, like an actual phone connected to the house. That's not like a personal phone. It's like the house phone, right? So these were really common back in the day. Uh, everybody had a house phone. Uh, we don't have a house phone. We got rid of ours like 10 years ago or something. Um, maybe not quite that. Well, no, maybe it was about that long. So it was a while ago. We got rid of our house phone. Um, but one of the reasons we got rid of it was that no one ever called it, of course. So once my uh, two daughters were old enough to have their own uh, phone number connected with their own phone, uh, I had a phone, my wife had a phone. What was the need for this extra phone sitting around the house? No one called out uh, and no one called in, uh, except for those kind of junk calls that you get, uh, which you often probably still get on your uh, a smartphone as well, right? So these would be people calling to uh, threaten you that maybe there's a warrant out for your arrest. Have you gotten those uh, phone calls where like this is the OPP uh, and they, or you get phone calls, it's like a recording of something else, or maybe they're trying to sell you duct cleaning or something for some reason. Uh, it's a lot of the same kinds of things. That's all we ever got, uh, which is pretty common for people who have a landline, right? Because those were listed in a phone book, an actual paper book uh, that had your name and number in it. And those could be accessed by uh, marketing companies who would then call uh, and offer to sell you different things. Uh, and often it was between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., uh, which is in uh, many households when people are home from school, home from work, before stuff has happened in the evening, like if you've got evening plans or if you've got evening programs, or in my case, if our, you know, my, when my kids were a lot younger, they might have swimming lessons or you know, piano or some, some kind of thing that little kids would do. Uh, this is the time when most people were around, right? Uh, making dinner or having dinner or whatever it is. And these telemarketers, people who would call to market stuff on the telephone would call between the hours of four and seven. Uh, and so, there's a series of inferences uh, that are made here. Um, it's happened in the past. So during this time when uh, we had the landline and people would often call in this time frame, um, we never really bothered to check uh, who was calling because most of the time, almost 100% of the time, anybody calling at that time of the day on that particular phone line was not calling to talk to anybody in the house in particular. They were calling with some kind of nonsense, right? Uh, so it's an inference. It's happened in the past. Every time it's happened in the past and I picked up the phone, it, there's a couple of clicks and then there's a recording uh, or there's somebody trying to sell something. So I just remember you know, a series of times I'm using 
uh, a long uh, you know, a kind of collection of memories. It's happened in the past. So I infer before I even pick it up, I'll bet it's not gonna be anybody I wanna talk to. So there's no sense even having to touch the phone. That's a prediction. I might be wrong sometimes. Maybe it is somebody trying to call to actually get in touch with me who I wanna talk to. Extremely unlikely, right? Uh, and so this is an inference. I used what happened in the past to predict something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I don't really know who's calling, but I think it's probably somebody I don't wanna talk to. And of course, the companies that were robocalling, uh, setting up machines to make these calls at that time, have also made a similar type of prediction based on their own research. In the past, they've probably been most successful at reaching people uh, in their homes between four and seven. Uh, or maybe most people in that particular demographic uh, between four and seven, wherever they got the number from. Uh, so they're making an inference that they're most likely to get somebody to pick the phone up at that time. I'm making an inference that I most likely don't want to pick the phone up at that time. Because on the other hand, if somebody called that number uh, at 1030 at night, uh, I would think like, you know, somebody's in trouble, <laughs> you know, or something important happened, or, you know, somebody died, or th those kinds of things, or something bad. If somebody called late at night, I would pick it up right away, because I'd assume something bad happened. It was an emergency. Uh, so I would make a different inference. Even though people haven't called, I would not make this inference. So these are specific predictions based on uh, what has happened. Uh, and we kind of do this so often that you don't even realize you're making uh, these kinds of predictions. These short, simple decisions we make based on our memory uh, are all examples of inferential reasoning. Not systematic in this case, they're just predictions. Uh, we also use our inferences and our memory to make generalizations. Uh, the generalization is a whole series of possible inferences that you could make. Uh, so rather than a specific, I'm not gonna pick the phone up right now, uh, prediction. This might be a generalization about a class of people. And we've taught, we will be talking about this later and referring to it as the representativeness heuristic, where you treat individuals as being representative of the entire class of, uh, that they belong to. So a generalization is an inductive conclusion about a whole class or group of things. And these can be positive or negative associations with police officers, for example. We talked about this when we discussed memory and when we discussed concepts. We said that if you have uh, positive uh, experiences with police officers in the past, uh, then you may be more likely to associate positive attributes, particularly if they're displaying features like, you know, kind of looking friendly and maybe helpful, short sleeves, uh, no mask on, you know, no sunglasses, a kind of friendly uh, demeanor. Uh, you might make lot, use all of that information to say, it's, it's good, you know, it's a, they're, they're helpful, uh, as opposed to the sort of riot gear that you might see uh, in when police are dealing with something that's more serious. Uh, so no facial uh, recognition, they've got sunglasses and a bulletproof uh, vest and all of that sort of stuff. So we've already talked about that example. Um, over the last few weeks, of course, this seems like is again this weird thing with the time. This was like just last week, uh, and it's like just a week and a half ago when the police finally uh, dismantled most of the protest, con the convoy protests in Ottawa. But it seems like a long time ago. Uh, so I, I just can't keep track of time anymore. But anyway, this just happened, <laughs> uh, even though it seems like a long time ago. Uh, there was a convoy uh, in Ottawa, right? Um, so the Freedom Convoy and Ottawa residents might have chosen uh, different attributes, right? So maybe you're treating or making inferences about each other in different ways. Uh, in both cases, the group has a, uh, an inference or a conclusion about their own uh, goals and about their own motivations and about their own, uh, uh, about their own group. Uh, and they may make different inductions or different predictions or generalizations about another group when there's a conflict, right? So at one point in the Ottawa uh, protests, uh, there were conflicts between residents of the downtown core uh, and the non-resident occupiers of the downtown core. Uh, thankfully, they weren't violent uh, interactions, which is a good thing, um, but there were sort of you know, stressful uh, interactions. Based on a few negative interaction, an Ottawa resident might form a negative generalization about the whole class of people uh, who were 
of protesting COVID restrictions uh, in, in Ottawa. So you might form an entire generalization about everyone there because you're not gonna meet everyone personally. Uh, maybe you're only gonna meet two or three people uh, who were you know, yelling, for example, or maybe two, two or three people who were at that time uh, honking their horns, uh, which was, a, I guess, a form uh, of um, e expression during the, uh, uh, during the protests. So a few negative interactions can cause you to form an entire generalization uh, about the entire class. Not everyone who was uh, involved with this protest would have uh, acted the same way. And everybody would have had uh, positive and negative uh, attributes, just like all of us do. Everybody would have had what seemed like good reasons to them to be there, and what probably seemed like bad reasons to everyone else to be there. And you can also imagine the reverse. Uh, so freedom convoyers might have had negative interactions with some Ottawa residents. There was a video that went around uh, of one of the people in Ottawa banging, like an old guy banging out a pot. Do you remember pot guy? Uh, did you ever see the video of the guy who was banging out a pot in front of somebody and some of the convoyers said, stop banging that pot, it's kind of irritating. And he's like, will you keep honking your horns? And so like those kind of conflicts. Uh, so the convoyers might have formed negative generalizations about downtown Ottawa residents. Uh, it's resolved itself for now, um, but you can imagine that those things, uh, you know, that probably has changed the way people see some of these other groups. Um, this is obviously the basis of stereotypes and prejudices. We can't avoid it. I mean, you can't avoid having, uh, making stereotypical judgments because if we don't know an individual uh, and you only know something about the group that they belong to, uh, you're going to make inferences based on what you know about that group. And if you know negative things about that group, you may make negative uh, predictions about that person. Uh, you may make positive predictions about that person. Uh, stereotypes are not necessarily good or bad. It's a natural way to make inductive inferences based on categories. We think conceptually. We think categorically. Prejudice uh, is something to be avoided because uh, that suggests that you make these uh, prejudgments uh, in a way that disadvantages someone else from being able to, uh, you know, to, to express how they are uh, or disadvantages them in terms of their opportunities. So you want to avoid those kinds of things, but uh, you also want to be aware that some of these kinds of stereotypical thinkings, uh, these kinds of inferences and generalizations that people make uh, are a natural consequence of the way the brain and the mind organize information and try to resolve uncertainties. A lot of people said, I, I read this sentiment uh, online often, uh, is that they feel differently when they see Canadian flags being flown now than they may have uh, two years ago. Uh, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you think differently about a car that has a Canadian flag on it now differently than you may have thought uh, in the past? It's become sort of a, uh, a symbol uh, for you know, a very uh, obvious feature uh, for a group that you might belong to. And if you happen to have negative predictions towards that group, that's going to be activated more quickly. Yeah, one of my friends lives in Ottawa and she was saying that the Canada flag used to kind of be associated with like cheering for Team Canada during the Olympics. And yeah. Like, more negative connotations. It was a very strange coincidence that it happened during the Olympics because typically you would associate people maybe flying little flags on their cars like during the Olympics or World Cup or something like that. Like, it's not uncommon to, uh, in London, for example, during World Cup to see, uh, you know, uh, flags from lots of different countries who are uh, competing in World Cup on the car, right? I mean, that's a common thing, in addition to Canada, right? Uh, and that would be something you might expect to see during the Olympics, might expect to be something you would see uh, at other times of the year, uh, and people started to have different associations. Uh, and so it's really changed some of our generalizations. Yeah, just going off of that, like, if you fly the team flag during Canada, yeah. This event has such a high saliency. I feel like people are going to remember it more, and that's what yeah. people associate the Canadian flag with, like more nationalistic or like patriotic sentiments, as opposed to like just the way that the Star Wars show. I, I think you're right about that, and I do think that it's probably going to change. Uh, you know, it, it will change the pe some people's perceptions. I wonder if it's going to impact like the next time we celebrate Canada. Like if that's going to it, it, show, like, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Or if it's just going to still be like a parade, like a celebration. 
it, it's it's an inter it's a good point and it's really interesting because it meant much of what we would associate with Canada Day, which would be parades and having flags, is exactly what was, you know, a lot of especially the local versions of the Freedom Convoy, which were mostly you know guys in trucks driving around slowly uh, on the weekend with flags in the back, which isn't hugely different from what usually happens maybe around Canada Day or something. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the same kinds of features are now associated with Canada Day. I'll come back. I think it also depends on the context of where it's being shown. Yeah. I was in downtown Toronto and I saw it by the lake just on the flagpole and it was just, it's reminded me just of Canada and the aesthetic, but then if I see it on like a truck or yeah. pickup, I start to associate that with yeah, that's a good point. So it's really just uh, when you see a big flag at a, um, you know, on the waterfront or something or at a port or at the airport uh, or, you know, Middlesex uh, College or University College Tower, uh, where there's a Canadian flag flying all the time, that's kind of like it, you expect it to be there, right? And you might expect things at Canada Day to be there. Um, big flag on a truck, in, like out of context, uh, has a very different meaning. Um, I was just going to say that I think a lot of people started to use the Canadian flag in a sort of negative way over the last year, even before the Freedom Convoy, because of um, all of the uh, graves they started to find in residential. Yeah. Stores. And how, like, it, it sort of in poor taste it was to celebrate. Canada Day last year instead of just like wearing orange and trying to respond yeah. to the loss of all of those young lives. And so like, I think people who are allied with indigenous people have already kind of been, you know, have a sour taste in their mouth when they see the Canadian flag, at least on Canada Day, when yeah. you know that all these like, tragedies happen. And so like that's also some context for the last year as well. It's I think that's a great point. And it, you know, because flags in general are overt symbols of group membership. Uh, when the context for that group starts to change a little bit, uh, or the context in which uh, those symbols are used by groups for different purposes or different kinds of groups, and it does change uh, your perception. Uh, so yeah, I think these are all great points. Um, and they all have to do with this idea of how we quickly want to make generalizations. Uh, and what's interesting about our changing perception of the Canadian flag, and I agree with uh, your comment uh, there that when you see it at a port, for example, or when you see it on the waterfront or you see it on a building um, like at, at Western, for example, it's, it's expected uh, and it sort of seems in context. Uh, and there are some different contexts uh, for which it seems out of place. Uh, and it's amazing to me how quickly some of those things can change though, how quickly uh, many people sort of have identified you know, Canadian flags on trucks as being a thing, whether you're, you know, aligned with that way of thinking or not, uh, it's still a, it's still a pretty clear symbol, right? It's still a pretty clear symbol of a series of beliefs uh, and as a, a series of uh, attributes, uh, which, you know, you may, if you were making these kinds of stereotypes and generalizations, then start to infer other things about the person who's driving the truck that has the two Canadian flags on the back, uh, depending on how you feel about uh, that particular uh, group or that particular series, or, you know, that particular movement, uh, you might have positive or negative uh, predictions about the person uh, who's driving. And that's an example of representativeness. Uh, so that when you start thinking about, uh, is that person who drives that pickup truck with the flag on the back, you know, is this somebody I can predict other things about? Uh, it's hard to avoid because if you haven't spoken to them, you don't know them personally, you use everything you can about what you know about what group or what context or what uh, kind they might belong to to make predictions about them. And the degree to which those groups become coherent and well-known, uh, the more likely you are to make those kinds of attributions. Uh, we'll talk about that, by the way, at the end of the next section when we talk about category coherence uh, and prediction. So I think this is a particularly good example about how these things can be changed pretty quickly uh, and how they can be changed uh, pretty dramatically uh, to have positive and negative uh, associations with something that uh, in many cases uh, we hadn't even thought much about 
uh, whether it's a strong uh, positive or negative association. Okay, so I wanna think, I'm gonna continue on this idea of what kinds of uh, information we think about when we're uh, making predictions about individuals in groups. Now, how many of you were in my cognitive psychology class last term? Uh, so actually, maybe we won't even bother doing this because we already did the same one. Um, let's go ahead and skip through the survey because you recognize all of this. It's about two thirds of you uh, that happen to be here that were in the class. Those of you that are on the um, uh, live chat here, which I ha haven't even checked. Are there any comments, by the way? I should probably check to see if somebody mentioned something in the chat. Oh, okay, this was just exam related stuff. So um, yeah, if you're, uh, those of you that are in the, uh, uh, the live stream, we're gonna skip over this uh, survey because it's one that we talked about uh, two, uh, last term. Um, and I'll be honest, there are other examples I could have chosen. Uh, I didn't realize until last night, this is the exact, because I cleared the data out from the fall term and I realized it's the same survey that I used. Uh, so I'm gonna recycle uh, some of this information. You'll be familiar with it, but let's just go through and talk about the expected results in the context of inferential reasoning, uh, because we didn't talk about it in the context of inference uh, in the fall class. Those of you that were not in my fall uh, 2135 class, uh, you're not missing, there's not new information. It just doesn't make sense to do the survey and have all of you see exactly the same things because you know the outcome. How many of you were not in my 2135 class uh, last fall? Okay, so it's new information. Excellent. I feel a little better now. Um, in the 1980s, uh, uh, Tversky and Kahneman uh, were a pair of researchers who did, you're probably familiar with their work, and we'll talk a lot about their research over the next three or four weeks. Um, Tversky and Kahneman's research was influential in uh, a lot of different fields. Uh, they're psychologists, so they were studying human behavior. Uh, they're sometimes thought of, especially Tversky, um, but both of them are often thought of as cognitive psychologists, social psychologists, uh, or behavioral psychologists, depending on the kind of research they've done. Uh, Kahneman and Tversky's work also uh, resulted in being Nobel Prize winners. There's no Nobel Prize in psychology. Uh, they won a Nobel Prize for economics because uh, in the field of economics, behavioral decision-making uh, is also a really important uh, field that draws on a lot of this basic uh, uh, understanding of how humans make decisions and how they use information to make decisions. Um, one of their landmark papers in the 1980s, and I've got a copy of the full paper on the uh, OWL site, uh, is looking at the conjunction fallacy. Uh, and this has to do with how people combine information of features they expect to see in individuals based on descriptions. Uh, and you can see how this might also play into making predictions about individuals that you meet who might uh, you know, have a Canadian flag on their vehicle uh, or individuals who might have uh, a different flag uh, or individuals who might have uh, a different background. So the kinds of things in which you uh, think about what features you expect to find and how you expect to combine. What Kahneman and Tversky wanted to show though is that uh, we have a tendency to reason from our knowledge uh, rather than using the information in front of us. Uh, they found over a lot of different studies uh, that people use heuristics, they use concepts, uh, they use probabilistic inferences uh, to make quick decisions about people, uh, to make quick decisions about scenarios, to make quick decisions about things. Uh, even sometimes when it flies in the face of what should be logically correct. In other words, we make errors in our judgments about people all the time because we assume that they are members of a category or members of a type or members of a class. Uh, and we make those judgments based on our incomplete knowledge of those classes. Uh, and one of the specific examples on which they suggested, they're calling this intuitive reasoning. Uh, for us, this is essentially an example of induction, uh, is that we make uh, logical errors around conjunctions of category membership. Now, you probably know, we'll talk more about probability theory when we talk about decision-making, but in basic probability theory, uh, you know that when you combine probabilities uh, using and, so if a thing is a member of this category and this category, uh, 
that you multiply those two probabilities together, right? The probability of this and this coming true is a multiplicative combination. And when you multiply a number less than one with a number, another number less than one, you get a number that's way less than one, right? The more things you multiply, the smaller that probability is. So when things are members of multiple categories, probabilistically, uh, the more things that they might be members of a category, the less likely they are uh, to fall into those multiple categories because it's a very small probability. Uh, in other words, single category membership uh, is more likely than uh, two category membership in this case. That's just the way probability works. If somebody might be a member of this category and might be a member of this category and you know what the probability is, it's much less likely that they would be a member of both and that they would be a member of either one. That's how the multipl uh, multiplicative combination works. However, people don't think that way uh, when one of the concepts is uh, highly salient. In other words, if we really identify an individual as belonging to a category, we're willing to ignore the actual probabilities and we're willing to ignore the mathematics. Um, so these would have been the examples if I were doing the survey, and you can still do it on your own, um, and you can see whether or not these seem reasonable. Uh, these would have been uh, the two questions that I were going to ask. And these are examples. They used more than just these two examples. Um, what they gave you was a description of a person uh, and then asked you, how likely is it that this person is a member of a series of different categories? So Bill is 34, intelligent, unimaginative, compulsive, and generally lifeless. In school, he was strong in mathematics, but weak in social studies and the humanities. Uh, this is an exaggerated stereotype of somebody who uh, is maybe not very good in social situations, uh, but really good with detail that comes from mathematics. Uh, and then we're asked to say, how likely is it that a person like this would be a member of these different categories? And then what subjects were asked to do was, depending on how we can do the task, we can either have them give a probability judgment uh, or in Kahneman's case, we're ranking what's the most likely to the least likely. Um, most people, uh, and these ones that are A, J, and A plus J are the critical ones uh, because uh, Bill is an accountant, uh, ends up being ranked pretty high. Um, there's something wrong with uh, accounting versus uh, playing jazz for a hobby. Both are perfectly valid things to engage in. Neither one of them necessarily lends itself to being lifeless. Um, but what most people found is that given this uh, exaggerated stereotype and given the possibilities here, uh, accountants seemed like the most likely uh, category that this person could be in. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to be uh, engaged in the humanities uh, to uh, be dealing with uh, budgets uh, and numbers. So people rank that high. Um, they tend to have different uh, opinions about some of these other things. Uh, they also tend to assume that someone who plays jazz for a hobby uh, might be more interested in the humanities and might be less likely to be described as lifeless uh, because, I don't know, it's kind of fun to play live music uh, for a hobby. So maybe people would be likely to say to put jazz, high, jazz low and accountant high. And then the critical one is Bill is an accountant who plays jazz for ho a hobby. In other words, a member of this and this. And what they found is that they tended to rank this higher than this. In other words, the conjunction is ranked higher than one of the individual constituents. People ignore the conjunctive rule. They ignore the rules of probability to assume that, yeah, we just think he's an accountant, right? He can be an accountant and do anything, but we're just gonna say he's an accountant. So all of these other things, even if we think jazz is unlikely, we think accountant plus jazz is more likely. That's a logical fallacy because you would have to have the individual constituents would have to be uh, higher than the conjunction of the two uh, because that's not the way probability works. Did you say that people are more likely to think that A and J are more likely? Yes. Than a and the other? So they rank the conjunction higher than J. Um, but either one of them, even if we think jazz is very unlikely, it has to be logically and mathematically the conjunction of the two is less likely because you're multiplying whatever that probability is. Um, the other one that's actually probably often cited a little bit more and maybe a little bit more familiar to people 
uh, is Linda, the 31-year-old, single, outspoken, very bright person. Uh, she majored in philosophy, uh, deeply concerned with discrimination and social justice, participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Um, in the 1980s, anti-nuclear demonstrations might have uh, been approximate to climate change demonstrations. Uh, there was a time in the 1970s and 1980s when people were strongly against nuclear power, uh, nuclear energy. Uh, that's not the case now because it's a much uh, cleaner form of uh, energy. But at the time, this would have been maybe the same kind of protest that you might be involved in if you were uh, strongly against or strongly in favor of action uh, to reduce uh, human made, uh, human caused climate change. So, same kind of idea. Um, here, people thought it was very likely that she would also be active in the feminist movement. Uh, and you can see how this is really not that different from the kinds of inductions we make when we're making predictions about people with flags on their uh, vehicles, or when we're making inductions about the kind of seeds that you're going to find inside a Hubbard squash. You're taking something you don't know and taking what you do observe and trying to make a prediction based on all of the other information that you've experienced, right? Uh, so what you've experienced, what you can observe, what you know, we don't know that she is a member of the feminist movement, but given all of this, we think it's likely that she would also identify as someone who is a feminist. So that gets ranked high by individuals. Uh, we also think um, some of these other things might be in between, and people tended to put things like bank teller and insurance sales fairly low. Um, one of the reasons, of course, is that someone who works at, in the customer facing uh, area of a bank uh, there isn't necessarily a lot of coherence to that category. Uh, lots of different kinds of people might be bank tellers. Uh, perhaps maybe they would be also feminists, uh, but perhaps maybe not. Uh, so we don't really know much about the types of people that are in that category. This is a high coherent category. This is a low coherent category. Um, but crucially, what they also observed is that people put the conjunction higher. Uh, and when we've done this in class, when I've done this in class, which I do it in class often, and I should remember in the future not to use the same example in successive classes that are different classes because then it kind of undermines the whole thing. But those of you that were in my uh, 2135 class in the fall, we did this in class uh, and we all made the same, uh, you know, our data looked the same. Uh, we tended to think that feminist bank teller was more likely than bank teller alone. Uh, in other words, we kind of replicate what they found. It's a little bit small. I should have blown this up just a little bit. Uh, so they have a group of 88 undergraduates uh, and they confirm their expectations. The percentage of respondents who displayed the predicted order, in other words, accountant is more likely than accountant plus jazz is more likely than jazz for Bill and feminist is more likely than teller plus feminist is more likely than feminist for Linda, 87% uh, and 85%. In other words, the majority of their subjects showed that rank order difference for those three critical categories. Uh, and the explanation given is that we reason from our knowledge. We don't use uh, base rates. We don't use probabilities. We kind of ignore that information when we're making decisions uh, and inferences about people. This idea is gonna come back at the end of next, uh, at the end of the section after the break, uh, when I talk about category coherence. Because one of the reasons is that some of these categories are have strong associations. Maybe they have strong feelings about people who might be uh, feminist or stronger coherence about people who might go into accounting. So this would be an example of availability, exactly. So they were gonna, well, it's an example of both representativeness and availability. So both of these things come into play. Uh, availability is the, the ease to with which things come to mind and making those decisions, especially uh, if your ideas or knowledge or concept of someone who is a feminist uh, or someone who is an accountant uh, comes to mind easily, uh, you're going to use that information. Representativeness comes into play uh, when you assume that an individual is representative of the entire category. Uh, and especially for these high coherence categories uh, or categories that you're very familiar with, which again would be representativeness, uh, it's going to anchor those judgments. So their whole point for this paper and a lot of the other papers they published around this topic uh, is that we tend to ignore some of the information uh, that's directly in front of us 
in favor of combining what's in front of us with what we already know. In other words, we tend to behave uh, with inductions, uh, quick inductions based on representativeness, based on availability, uh, based on memory, uh, in order to make the prediction as quickly as possible. So we're ignoring some of the information that's in front of us, in other words, the conjunctions, uh, in favor of these more salient categories. Does that seem pretty clear? We also display inductive uh, inference when we're testing hypotheses. Uh, and most of us test hypotheses. Of course, if you're, how many of you are doing an honors thesis right now? Uh, so if you're doing an honors thesis, you are working on um, testing a specific hypothesis. Uh, and you learn about hypothesis testing when you're taking your uh, research-based courses and your methodology courses uh, and your statistics courses, right? Uh, so you're learning how to make uh, predictions about specific hypotheses. When we're testing hypotheses, we're making a prediction uh, that can either uh, be confirmed or fail to be confirmed, right? Uh, and then we carry out tests to try to confirm or fail to confirm those hypotheses. Um, that's, that's laid out pretty clearly in scientific thinking, but of course it's the kind of thing uh, we do all the time. Um, I mentioned, I made a joke about the, uh, you know, the, the threatening geese on campus uh, this time of year, um, you're free to make a to make a hypothesis about whether or not uh, that goose is going to attack, uh, and you can test that hypothesis by walking close to the geese, right? You probably have a way. You probably have an inference, right? Uh, that they probably will, right? Even if you've never, per how many of you have ever been personally attacked by a goose? Maybe not so much, or maybe some. Yeah, I've only been, I've only been chased. I've never actually been contacted by a campus goose. You've been. Anybody been contacted directly? Like, not, yeah, so it's not good, right? Uh, I try to I go running in Springbank Park in the mornings. Um, it's a great place to run uh, down by the river, um, except during the month, month of March, because that's when the geese are most threatening. So I try to avoid uh, certain areas because that's where, I'm, that's where it seems like I've been most likely uh, to be attacked by them. Uh, so you can test the hypothesis. You can say, this goose that's honking at me uh, right next to the uh, park where I parked my car. Is that a threatening honk or is that just, a, you know, they're just chatting with each other. Uh, you can test the hypothesis and get closer and see whether or not uh, they're going to respond the way you predict. But you're making a prediction, you're observing information, and you can then determine how good your inference is. Uh, in a lot of these cases, we're talking about inferences about, you know, what kind of person is driving a truck with a flag on it, or what kind of seeds are gonna be inside of a squash, or what kind of person is gonna display a certain kind of behavior. Oftentimes we don't actually find out, right? That's the problem with using representativeness to make predictions about people, uh, is that we often prejudge them, we assume that they have those features, we assume that they're gonna have those behaviors, uh, and maybe we don't actually test to see if they do have certain attributes. Hypothesis testing is when we go that next step. We make an inference, we make a prediction, but then we test to see if that prediction pans out. Uh, it's a set of beliefs about the worlds that can be stated and tested. Uh, inferences can then be verified with additional inference, uh, with, with additional information. So if you have a prediction about other things that a person driving a truck with a large flag on the back believes, uh, you could stop and have a conversation with them and you can have a series of tests, uh, test questions like, how do you feel about this? And how do you feel about this? And maybe you can predict whether or not those things will turn out. Some of them might, some of them might not. And you can then update your beliefs based on the information that you've uh, discovered. Same thing with the campus geese. Uh, if you've never uh, personally been attacked by the goose, you still maybe make these predictions, but maybe not always. Uh, maybe you can walk right past that particular goose that seems very threatening uh, by spring at parking lot or something like that, one that you've been avoiding. You can test it and maybe you'll be wrong and then you can update your beliefs or update your priors. So hypothesis testing is important in everyday thinking and scientific thinking. Uh, a number of years ago, actually as many years ago, bought the first house uh, that we purchased in London uh, it was an older home in Oak Ridge, and it uh, had a pretty bad leak in the basement, which we didn't know until uh, the first winter uh, we were in the home. 
Uh, so if you've ever been in a home where there's a, a leak in a finished basement, the first thing you would notice is you'd walk downstairs and your feet would feel kind of cold and wet. And you'd think like, am I imagining things? Or is this carpet soaked uh, with ice cold water? Uh, and at which point you think, oh, okay, great. There's a leak in the basement, terrific. Um, it's hard to know exactly where that water comes from, right? So there's a lot of different tests you wanna do because some of the treatments for a leaking basement can be more or less expensive, more or less invasive. So before you do any of these things, you wanna go through a series of diagnostic tests. You test hypotheses to figure out exactly where the water is coming from. Maybe it's coming from a pipe that burst. Maybe it's coming from the ground. Maybe it's coming from ice melting. There's a lot of different things that can cause water to seep into a basement. Maybe it's coming from the storm sewer. You would probably do this kind of thing if you have uh, a problem with your, uh, with your laptop. Uh, so if it's not behaving properly, there's a series of tests. What's the first thing you usually do? You just turn it off and start it over again, right? Uh, and sometimes that helps. Uh, if you own a vehicle and the vehicle isn't behaving properly, you take it into uh, Honda or you take it into Toyota or whatever, uh, and they're gonna run a series of diagnostics. They also have a hypothesis. If you're not feeling well, uh, and you're not exactly sure what it is. Uh, you would go to the physician with a, maybe a series of complaints, a primary complaint. You would say, this is bothering me. Uh, at which point the physician might order additional tests uh, to test a specific hypothesis, often to rule things out. Um, this time of year, I don't know if any of you have access to those rapid uh, antigen tests, uh, but you know I have a box of them at home, right? Uh, and every so often, uh, especially during the peak of the Omicron wave, uh, if I was feeling unwell, I might take it, not because there's anything I can do about it, but it might mean that I would be less likely uh, to go out, or maybe I would stay in the basement or something at home with a mask on. Uh, so you have a hypothesis, is this an allergy or is this COVID? Uh, and then you can rule those things out. And those of you that have seasonal allergies, which around here is most of us, uh, probably had the same thing over the last few years. Is this allergy or is this COVID? And then you try to rule those things out with a series of you know, information gathering. So with the wet basement, uh, lots of places water could come from so we can devise a test. Uh, suppose I say the water is coming from a crack in the foundation. Uh, this would be the worst case scenario for a leak in a basement because it would mean that a large part of the house would need to be excavated. Uh, and possibly rebuilt. So this would be something we couldn't just ignore, right? So if there's a crack in the foundation, there's something severely wrong uh, with the house. If there's a leaky pipe and it just flooded, there's something much less severely wrong with the house. So we wanna rule all of these things out. Um, we had a guy come over uh, because I couldn't possibly diagnose this. I'm not a, uh, a plumber of any kind. So guy comes over and he says, it's probably coming from a crack in the foundation. And I said, well, how do you know it's coming from a crack in the foundation? What if it's coming from somewhere else? Because I don't want to you know, dig around the side of the house and rebuild the foundation. He said, well, we have one test we can do. Uh, let's go into this crawl space over here. Uh, there's a crawl space that was the same level as the finished basement. Crawl space was unfinished, uh, different section of the house. He said, if there's no water there, then we'll assume that it's coming from somewhere else. If it was coming into the foundation, it would just seep through the whole uh, bottom half of the house. We go into the crawl space, there's no water in the crawl space. Uh, so we have to develop a new hypothesis. We collected enough evidence to disconfirm the original hypothesis. Water is not coming from a crack in the foundation. Let's come up with a different hypothesis. Maybe it's the ice that's on the side of the house is melting uh, coming into the house, uh, at which point we look to see where the water was coming from, how close it was to the ice, and notice that there was water along the side of the house right below the ice. Uh, so this is an example of collecting information successively with each inference. And again, we do this all the time. You do it when you're testing yourself for COVID. Uh, you would do it when you're testing whether or not the goose is going to attack. Uh, you would uh, do this if you're figuring out if there's something wrong with your phone or wrong with your laptop, or if there's a leaky, uh, uh, if, there's, if there's a leak in the basement of your house. Uh, if you're living in a house that, how many of you are living in sort of what would be described as substandard student housing? Uh, if there is a leak somewhere, uh, 
uh, you've got to notify your landlord, right? Uh, and they're going to want to uh, do the same kind of things, uh, carry out a series of informations in order to figure out what they need to do next uh, to fix the problem. All examples of inference. Um, many times uh, we're using inference retrospectively. Uh, so retrospective information means, and in this case of the ice dam, uh, we've observed the evidence after the fact. So we're trying to use inference not to predict something new. We're trying to use the inferential process to predict something that already happened. <laughs> we're trying to go back. Uh, and that's much more complicated. That's why hypothesis testing is useful. If we've made an inference, a retrospective inference about what caused something, we've made a causal inference about what's causing the leak in the basement, uh, we didn't see the original event happen. We can make some assumptions, uh, but in order to determine whether or not those assumptions are warranted, we might need to do additional tests. That's the point of hypothesis testing, to create a new situation where we can observe the causal link. The problem is that for a lot of stuff, uh, we don't have the ability to do all of that testing. Um, lots of things, uh, and a lot of these examples um, seem so dated now in the era of COVID, uh, where we've you know, been learning a lot more about public health. Uh, many of the things that we've uh, embraced uh, to ward off COVID, some of them worked, some of them didn't. How many of you remember back in the old days, uh, in 2020, two years ago, uh, when like you'd go to the grocery store and like have to use like Lysol on the bags or something. People would say like, you know, make sure you sanitize the bags before you bring them in the house because you might catch COVID. Well, nobody knew, right? So that was one plausible, plausible way in which you could stop the spread of the disease. Uh, social distancing, standing six feet away from people. That seemed plausible at some time. Uh, maybe it's not as important as it used to be. Uh, so some of the things that maybe we thought would work, uh, didn't work. And some of the things that we didn't think would work maybe turned out to be more useful in order to stop the spread. A lot of these other things, uh, again, discovered through retrospective designs, which makes them hard to understand. And that's one of the reasons why we struggle to figure out what works and what doesn't work with COVID. Uh, we can't see it. Uh, you can't see the particles spreading. Uh, you can only see that some people, but not everyone, gets really sick when they're exposed to it. Uh, and so trying to figure out those retrospective causal links it's very difficult, right? And this is, as I'm sure you'll see in a few slides, you already know this, this is the difficulty of inferring causation from correlational structure. Uh, we're hardwired to assume that things that are correlated are also causally linked. Uh, our inferential process and our generalization process, the basics of stimulus generalization that we uh, have inherited from other uh, species and evolved, the idea of stimulus response association makes it easy for us to think that things are things that are correlated are also causally linked. Uh, but when they're more complex uh, uh, scenarios, like disease, for example, uh, we have to be careful not to make that assumption. Um, for a while, there was a, a, a scare between antibi antibiotics and breast cancer. A uh, paper came out about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, suggesting a possible link between people who are prescribed a lot of antibiotics as, as uh, young adults and later likelihood of, uh, of being diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, as often happens in, uh, in health media, uh, that sometimes gets turned into a causal link, right? Antibiotics cause breast cancer, uh, which was never the intention of the uh, original study, was just to notice that individuals who might have difficulty fighting off infection uh, at a younger age might also uh, be more likely to develop other kinds of uh, infections, or in this case, uh, uh, cancer uh, later in life. How many have ever heard of the connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease? Has anybody heard of this? People don't talk about it quite as often, but there was a time uh, back, maybe about 20 years ago, uh, when it was a really big concern. And people were worried that if you, you know, drink out of an aluminum can or if you cook with aluminum cookware, that you would get aluminum in your body and that somehow that would uh, cause Alzheimer's disease. There's no link between the two, um, only just that there, I think it, at some point, aluminum was used to stain cells uh, in the brain that were used to study uh, and diagnose people with Alzheimer's disease uh, post-mortem. 
Uh, and so that suggested a, a connection between the two, but not one that's causal. Um, at some point, do you all remember when those water bottles were considered bad to drink out of water out of? Do you remember that from a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago? Uh, some kind of BPA, they called it. Uh, so you still see that in water bottles, BPA free, right? Uh, there was some suggestion that maybe whatever kind of plastic uh, could cause something. Nobody even knew what it could cause, except that it would show up uh, in your body later on. So you would notice that this chemical was in your body. It was also something that plastic water bottles were made of. So therefore, uh, there's a causal link. Uh, the one that's probably the most relevant for us now uh, is the uh, link that people argued about for years uh, between autism uh, and the series of vaccines that young children get, uh, the measles, mumps, uh, and rubella uh, vaccines. Uh, again, no causal link, uh, but at some point, uh, uh, you know, one paper suggested a, a correlation uh, between these two, uh, uh, between the incidence of autism uh, and uh, early exposure to vaccines. Like someone explain like the thing between autism and vaccines because autism is usually some issue with like sensory processing or emotional processing or any other processing usually in the frontal lobe or something. Yeah. So like how did they find that the the vaccines may have that contribution to it? So uh, without going into uh, too uh, too far afield, uh, this was a paper that's since been retracted that was published. I think um, maybe this was even in the late '90s or something. Uh, by someone, uh, by a physician named Andrew Wakefield, uh, who noticed a court in the original paper, a small sample uh, found that people, there was a greater likelihood to be diagnosed with autism later uh, with individuals who had received those vaccines in a certain schedule uh, versus people who hadn't received the vaccines in a certain schedule. So there's a, a possible correlation, though it turns out it was a small enough group uh, to not be uh, a noticeable correlation. But I think your point is that what's the, how could it cause one or the other? Uh, and that's of course one of the, the that was the original big uh, concern about those studies is that uh, the causal mechanism uh, with a measles, mumps and rubella vaccine in infancy, uh, there's no, no agreed upon way in which that could later manifest itself uh, in the kinds of sensory processing uh, uh, differences seen most common in autism spectrum disorder. And at the time, of course, too, uh, the definition of autism spectrum disorder was different than it is uh, now. So it's a broader uh, category than it was uh, when Wakefield was, uh, was originally studying this. Um, unfortunately, it kicked off, you know, a 30 year uh, anti-vaccine uh, sentiment uh, among uh, in individuals, yes. You talked about our evidence that why retrospective evidence doesn't work. Yeah. Anything that shows that it is a beneficial method of looking at things? Well, it's totally a beneficial way of looking at things. Uh, what you would also need to do is then uh, these additional hypothesis tests. In other words, things like randomized controlled trials in the medical set. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, that many of these are very difficult to do in controlled settings. Um, it would be unethical uh, to take a group of uh, children, vaccinate them properly, a group of children and not vaccinate them properly, uh, given that what we know about some of the things that the vaccines actually help, uh, and then study later uh, connections. Uh, it would be, um, so many of these things would be difficult to carry out in controlled settings. Uh, and that's why it's such a challenge. This is useful information, uh, but it doesn't, it, alone, it's not enough information uh, to make the best inferences. But the reason I'm bringing these up is that we have a tendency uh, to make these inferences anyway. Uh, we're sort of conditioned or our minds work in a way where we quickly gather as much information as possible that's correlated in the world and try to predict what's coming next. Uh, so this, you know, our tendency to uh, make these errors or to over prescribe or to over to assume that these correlational designs are stronger than they really are uh, results from our own tendency uh, to make these quick uh, inductions. Uh, so I've got a few more slides and we should be able to take a break at about 1045. Is everybody doing okay? Um, and then we've got the second half will be just about the same amount of time. So these retrospective designs look backward and examine causal factors. 
Um, and I just want to briefly talk about our problems with correlation, and then we'll take a short break. Um, you all know what a correlation is because you probably learned this in uh, high school. Uh, you learned this, uh, you know, you learned about the differences between uh, two different variables and how positive correlations work, how negative correlations work. Uh, and these are descriptive, they describe a state, uh, they describe how a possible relationship between two things, but not necessarily one that's meaningful. They just des they describe what you can observe. Uh, that if uh, something increases uh, and something else increases along with it, uh, that there's a positive correlation. In other words, those things are co-related. Uh, they seem to be related. They behave as if they're linked in some way, but we may not know what that linked structure is. However, simple organisms, uh, like us and other non and other non-human uh, organisms, we're looking for as much information as we can to make sense of the world, to make structure to the world. And if we notice a relationship between one thing and another thing, and that every time one thing increases, another thing increases, we assume that's meaningful. Uh, and we try to use that to make predictions about what's going to happen next. Correlation is all about predictions. If you notice that as A increases, B increases along with it, then you only need one piece of information to infer the other, right? Uh, you can predict what's gonna happen in B if you already know what's gonna happen in A and vice versa. Uh, we don't necessarily know if there's a causal link, but we know that we can predict something that we haven't seen yet. So we're always trying as organisms to take advantage of correlated structure in the world to make predictions to reduce uncertainty. Negative correlations, it just means that if one thing goes up, the other thing goes down, right? Uh, and that, again, is a relationship that we can take advantage of. That means that we don't need to know B, we only need to know A. Uh, we don't need to know as much about B, or we can predict something about B without even having to observe it. Anytime we can reduce the amount of information we need to gather, uh, or reduce uh, uncertainty, or reduce, reduce the amount of uh, effort we need to place into uh, remembering, storing, and attending to information, that's all the better. So we're just trying to make use of correlated structure in the world to get by. Um, and of course, we also know that uh, causation is often linked with correlation, but unless we have additional evidence, like a mechanism or a hypothesis test, uh, it's really difficult to make a strong claim. Um, sometimes results can be presented as if there's causation, and we refer to this as an illusory correlation. In other words, a correlation where one really doesn't exist. It seems to exist, but it doesn't really exist. In other words, these things happen uh, to correlate, but there's no uh, reason to expect them to. Uh, for example, um, these are the kinds of things you can see if you do a quick Google search on illusory correlations. Uh, here is the browser, uh, Internet Browser, Internet Explorer. How many of you guys all, re all remember Internet Explorer? Uh, so do you still use Internet Explorer or is it called Microsoft Edge browser, Chrome or whatever you use now? But uh, Internet Explorer would have been the Microsoft browser uh, that was popular uh, in, the, um, in the early 2000s, the late 90s. Um, and as its market share collapsed due to Chrome, um, also the murder rate in the United States went down. Uh, very strong relationship, just one that's not meaningful, right? But if you happen to be alive during this time and you had access to this information, if you knew about how many people were being murdered and you knew about how uh, likely it was that Internet Explorer was being used, uh, you could still predict one from the other. So this is a predictive correlation. Uh, you would be able to predict this relationship. You could extrapolate beyond 20 11 and say, you know, once we get no use of Internet Explorer, we should expect there to be almost no murders. It would be not meaningful, but you could still try to do it. Is available for the fact that a lot of people at that time Internet Explorer, like during the there's there there's lots, yeah, exactly. There are lots of other uh, additional pieces of information. Uh, the fact that Chrome was being used more likely uh, in the later uh, 20 in you know 2010 and on uh, has nothing to do uh, with whether or not uh, there's a high or a low homicide rate in the United States. There's lots of other factors. There just happen to be two factors going on, and we've picked two arbitrary variables and noticed a, a relationship between the two. 
um, the number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool, and the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in seem to have a strong relationship uh, between them. Uh, this is uh, the number per capita consumption of cheese and the number of people who died becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Uh, so you can see lots of completely nonsense things can be correlated. So this correlated structure in the world and our job as organisms is to try to determine which one of these are meaningful uh, because these wouldn't be meaningful even if they seem to have a predictive structure. Um, and it's really a common cliche, right? Uh, correlation does not imply causation. Uh, this is something that most of us probably learn. It's a way to shut down an argument. Uh, if somebody says, yeah, you know, these two things are kind of related, you can say, yeah, correlation does not imply causation. Um, so why do we still do it, I guess, is the question. And that's what I want to leave us with in the last two minutes here. Even though we all know that correlation does not imply causation, we still fall prey to it. Otherwise, all of those retrospective designs that I talked about, we wouldn't have really cared too much about those things. We wouldn't care about aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. Wouldn't care so much about uh, the, uh, the, the non-relationship between uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines uh, and autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so we might not place too much stock in these things, but we still do. So why do we still assume that there's a causal relationship in correlated structure? Well, it's for the same reason uh, that we make those mistakes, the conjunction error mistakes. Uh, those also are logical errors. We're using what we know about the world to make uh, a quick decision, even if it's wrong sometimes. So uh, Pearson, uh, who defined uh, the original Pearson correlation uh, coefficient, uh, you can't see the top here, sorry. I just realized that the top of the slide here is cut off. I got to remember the keyboard shortcut to, uh, oh, that's a big keyboard shortcut. I'm never going to remember that. Um, Pearson's correlation coefficient was designed to do that. It was designed to give us a number. Uh, he wrote, the higher the correlation, the more certainly we can predict from one member what the value of the associated member is, he wrote in one of his major works, The Grammar of Science. This is the transition of correlation into causation. So Pearson originally intended the Pearson R correlation as a way to gauge our strength of, uh, the strength of evidence uh, for causal structure. Uh, so a strong correlation, uh, correlation coefficient, we can't take it as the only evidence for causation, but it's correlated with causation, right? It's indicative of causation. We know it's not ex exclusive proof, uh, but it is a necessary condition for most uh, causal links. Um, the other way to think about it is, let's see if I get a little bit closer here. Oh, I guess I can't because I was, because I touched the keyboard and apparently that, uh, is that lots of things are correlated, right? Here's the whole universe of things that are correlated with each other, uh, whether it's Nicolas Cage movies and drowning uh, or uh, the likelihood of wearing a mask over a period of time and being able to transmit uh, COVID uh, to uh, someone else in the room. So lots of things are correlated. Uh, the amount of time that you study and how well you perform on an exam is probably correlated, right? More studying, better performance. Uh, that's probably a causal link as well. So the issue here is that lots of things are correlated. Some things are also causally linked. But for almost all of the cases that we can imagine, or most of the cases or all of the cases that we observe, things that are correlated are not necessarily causally linked, but things that are causally linked are usually almost always correlated with each other along uh, a long period of time. So when things do have a causal structure, when there is a causal link, when you cause something to happen with your own agency, those things are observed as being correlated. So we see that most things that are uh, correlated don't have to be causally linked, but things that are causally linked are correlated. Uh, this is what we focus on. And so we have a tendency to make this error, even though we know it's not true, just like we know that conjunctions aren't more likely than the individual constituents, we still ignore it uh, and we make these cognitive errors. 
Okay, so we'll stop here and we will pick this up after uh, a little bit later than I thought, but let's still go with 15 minute break. Is that okay? Uh, so we'll come back here in 15 minutes. I think we can finish things up uh, in just about the right amount of time. So we'll uh, pick up with the problem of induction, why it works, why it shouldn't work, and how we actually do it. So how about it's 10.53. Let's be back here at 10, at 11.10. Sound good? Okay. See you in a bit.